Point here this morning, please forgive me. Yes. I'm, I'm a little bit been fighting an infection, so I just couldn't get it ready. Didn't give it to my PowerPoint person soon enough. Okay. And for those of you who'd like to know, I I got a nice glass for my water because people tell me it glugs on this on the video. <laughs> because if you've ever seen me drink, I don't take sips. So I'm working on it. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to be reading verses 1, verse 1 and verse 14, and then we'll be flipping over to 1 Corinthians. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and every sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. King James says it this way, therefore, I'm sorry, to lay aside every weight, every weight and every sin. Hence the title, let's drop the weight. We're all trying to drop that weight. So we want to drop those things, those things that hinder us. But I want you to understand what's so significant about it. Um, in verse 14, there, it's a very... Um, D disturbing verse sometimes if we read it. It says, Pursue peace with all men. Oh. Is it 11? Verse uh, 14 says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification depending on your translation, it might say holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. And when you read those things, the first one tells us to lay aside every weight and every sin. This verse says, pursue... holiness. Pursue righteousness. Pursue sanctification. Pursue peace with all men. And in, t in Christendom today, we don't ever want to talk about sanctification or holiness because people tell you you're trying to lay guilt on us. You're trying to control my life. You're trying to tell me what I can and cannot do. And I, I have no intentions of doing that whatsoever. So as we speak this morning, I'm going to talk about holiness. I'm going to talk about disciplining ourselves to pursue sanctification. Paul tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That we need to move ahead in our relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I want to talk about this because I want you to understand something. When you look at verse 14, the first thing people argue is, Oh, that means salvation by works. Salvation by works. And you have to work your way or you won't see the Lord. I, I, I spent some time and I want you to understand this. It says... In the King James, it's without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The phrase here, no one will see the Lord, is not a reference to salvation. I believe that he's not saying you won't go to heaven, but what if you don't achieve holiness here on earth? If that be the case, none of us are going to go. You all get that, right? So what exactly is he saying? What he's saying is that you can't earn your way to heaven. There's no chance of that whatsoever. But what he's referring to is that right here, right now, that without seeking the Lord, without seeing the Lord, without talking about living our life in the presence of God and walking in His power, without that kind of holiness, we can live a, a life without sin. We can live a clean life. We can have that righteousness. But if we don't, we will not see the work of the Lord in our lives here. We won't see it here on earth. Well, and that's a big deal. We won't see the favor of the Lord. We won't see Him moving in us. And so He says, lay aside every weight and every sin. And I love the King James because it says besetting sin. How many of you know what a besetting sin is? Christina, can you turn this microphone down a little bit? How many of you know what a besetting sin is? Nobody? Nobody speaks King James? Mm -hmm. Sin that keeps dragging us down. A, a sin that we keep struggling with drags us down all over the place. It's not a phrase we use much anymore. 
but it causes us again and again. How many of you ever felt that way? And then come to a place where you are before the presence of the Lord and you go, oh dear God, can you forgive me for this one again? And so it's to lay aside or put down every weight and every besetting sin so that the presence of the Lord can work in us and through us. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 tells us jumped on Judah's back. How many of you know that Mandy isn't a sin? See, he's not talking about just sins. We Obviously, we know things that are wrong. But how many of you know there are some weights that cause us difficulties in our Christian walk? They're weights. They're nothing sinful. And there's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves, but they're a weight. Now, how they become a weight, in my opinion, is that they, they be, we give them too much value. How many of you guys have ever been dieting? Joe, okay, one. Well, if you want to dive and you go to the bottom, they give you what's called a weight belt. And literally what it is, it's enough weight to counteract your weight so you can drop and go all the way to the bottom and swim or walk around. But if you need to swim in a hurry, I'm going to tell you, if there's a shark coming at you or you see something like that, the first thing your dive instructor is going to tell you is drop the weights. It's much easier to swim without that weight belt on. It's much easier to run without that backpack on. It's much easier to accomplish what God has for you to do without carrying that extra weight. Now what can that extra weight be? In my opinion, for a lot of us, that extra weight are some things that we allow to control us. They are things in the past things that change us, things that we think about. The reason I've chosen these two passages in 1 Corinthians and in, in Hebrews is simply because before something can be a weight, before something can even be a sin, it needs to be a thought. Cast on every evil imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. How many of you know that there's nothing that you do, nothing that you, where there's no sin you commit, there's no good deed you commit, there's no neutral thing that you do that doesn't begin as a thought. Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, simply because everything in our life begins in our mind. Jesus said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So why is it so important that we control what we think, that we lay aside every sin and every weight? Because those things will eventually become who we are. The best example I have in life is myself. So I'm going to use myself this morning a little bit. For those of you who don't know, um, I was not always a Christian. I got saved at 18 years old. And... I 
had some things that I had to put away. And I thought I was doing great, but I realized my wife laughed at me because I was, uh, I don't want to use the word lazy, because I've always worked hard and a lot. I was selectively lazy. <laughs> You know, I work 18 hour days, always have. But then I come home and I don't do nothing. I wanted a pizza, I called my brother up to bring me a pizza at midnight. And the funny thing was, he brought me a pizza. And my wife would say, you know, that's just horrible. And I'd say, well, you can say no. But he didn't, so I just tend to take advantage of it. And to make a long story very short, I read a verse that said, if you want to be great, in God's kingdom, become the servant of all. And I'm going to tell you something. That was no easy task for me. I had to change the way I thought. I had to change the way I thought about people, the way I thought about things, the way I did things in my life. And what happened was I would begin to change things because if I didn't change thinking, and I want to be what God says. I want to be great in his kingdom. So I made a conscious effort, and I do mean a conscious effort, to begin to serve. I had to, somebody needed a ride, I'd pick them up. Somebody needed this done, I'd pick them up. We were in a bigger church. They said, somebody needs to clean the floors, I went and did the floors. Somebody wants to clean the bathroom, I went and did the bathroom. Somebody needed this, I went and did it. At home, I was to begin to start to change. If there was a need, I, I met it. Now, I want you to understand something. For me, that was a great deal of work. I had to change the way I thought completely. <coughs> Changing the way I thought changed who I was. Now, Pastor Gail, on the other hand, her first, her first thought is to, to do. That's just the way it is. Her first thought is to do. Even if she's tired, sick, miserable, no, she's not. I, mean, I don't mean miserable as in a person. I mean physically not feeling well. And, and no matter where she is, she'll get up and do for somebody else because that's, what she, that's who she is. That's her nature. She had never had to work on it. She was that way before she was a Christian. She just got more that way after she was a Christian. So much so that it actually ended up putting her in the hospital. Because all she did was give and give and give and give and serve and serve and serve and serve and never worried about here. And while she was in the hospital, God spoke to her and said, I want you to give, I want you to serve, I want you to consider others first, but you're no good to others if you don't take care of you. So she had a little bit of balance. But the truth of the matter is, we need to change the way we think. We need to lay aside every sin. Now, the reason we have been so um, focused this year on putting scriptures in our lives and in our hearts because two things. You can't know what a sin is if you don't know what God's word is. You can't know what's a weight if, if you can't... If you don't know the word of the Lord and what it is. You can't believe God for healing. You can't believe any of those things if you don't know what it is. So the purpose is we want to change the way we think. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So there has to be something to measure your behavior, to measure your thought process, to measure what it is. And that something is the word of God. Roman Vincent Peale made it famous, and he said simply this, if you change your thoughts, you can change your world. I've listened to people say, well, it's not that easy. But no, it is not that easy. But I want you to understand something. It isn't easy, but it can be done. We can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's not a bad thing to be willing to change. Now the problem as I see it is most people today, and it's a sorry thing to say that we live in a world that, that fosters and propagates it, most people today are negative. Would you tend to agree with me? But for a believer, I want you to understand something. That's an evil imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And we need to cast it down. Now, cast down means throw down, shatter, destroy, get rid of. We need to stop that situation. And I'm going to tell you why. Negative thought processes cause you to be a negative person. A negative thought process will rob you. No, Christians don't want to hear this, but I want you to understand it. Rob you of your faith. 
God can heal others, but he won't heal me. God provides for others, but he doesn't take care of me. You don't understand my family, that's just the way it is. I'm Irish. I'm Italian. I'm a victim, of, I'm a child of abuse, I'm a child of addiction. You don't know what it's like. And even if I do know what it's like, you don't really care because you are now speaking that God cannot do it. And I want you to understand something. Listen to me very, very clearly. God cannot do it. When you say God cannot do it, do you know God cannot do it? What? Pastor Jim, that sounds a lot like double talk. When you say God cannot do it, God cannot do it, or will not do it, because we know He's sovereign and all powerful. He can do whatever He wants to, whomever He wants, but He will not do it. Scripture says clearly, without faith. It's impossible to please God. Anything that isn't of faith is sin. I can tell you, doubt, insecurity, negative attitudes are not of faith. Well, what do you say? What do you say? I'm sick. I, I, I've got um, chemotherapy going through my body. I, I, I got this. I got that. How do you how do you say something positive? How do you exercise faith? Fine. I believe. I believe that God is going to use this chemotherapy. This medicine of doctors to heal me of this disease to get up because he has healed all my diseases dr. Ganasti said something to me that, I, that is stuck with me forever and she simply said I can treat only God can heal that's a doctor and I just love the expression we go you do everything you're gonna do but only God can heal the best, I mean, if you're a surgeon, the best you can do is cut out the bad part. You know, and make makes the rest of the body better, but you really didn't do any healing, right? Now, surgeons, they think they're wonderful, and they are. Um, I wouldn't be able to move my arm if I didn't. My daughter wouldn't be standing healthy right now. So I do believe surgeons can do great things. But I, also, I know that it's without, without God. It doesn't make any difference at all. I don't put my faith in a surgeon. I don't put my faith in the doctor. I don't put my faith in the drug or the medicine. I put my faith in God and say, God's going to do it. He might use his medicine. He might use his doctor. He might use his skillful hands. But God is the healer. But when we think negatively, it's very difficult to say, God is bigger than my problems, and you've made your problems so big. Because all you do is talk about them. All you do is propagate them. All you do is lift them up. It becomes, it creates a difficulty in our lives. It's hard to say I am blessed with that anything. And I want you to know, first off, it, it causes a place in our lives where we rob us of our faith. The second thing that kind of thought process is, which is why we need to be cast down every evil imagination, is that it robs us of our desire to do anything. Do you ever notice somebody who has resolved themselves to something negative? Do you know what they do about it? That's right, nothing. It creates inactivity. Whether it's an addiction, I, I can't overcome it. Weight, I, ju I just can't do anything about it. Um, bad attitude, job. When you have resolved yourself and you begin to think that kind of those negative thoughts, you become inactive. And you will not change anything if you don't change your thoughts. You will not change anything if you don't believe that you can change anything or if you don't believe that change, that it matters. And so when we do that, it causes us to have the idea of inactivity. And it doesn't matter what it is. If it's weight loss, if it's exercise, if it's any of those things, then all big things in your life, attitude changes, <laughs> marriages, relationships. If you don't believe nothing will change, nothing will change. We need, and I'm not talking about just having a positive thought process. I'm talking about believing the God of the impossible to do the impossible. One of the other things that happens when we allow that thought process to be negative, when we let those evil imaginations exalt themselves against God, 
God says he is good. God says he's a healer. God says he's a deliverer. God says he's a provider. All those negative thoughts say just the opposite. When we let them permeate our minds, they cause us to enter into isolation. We don't enter into communion with each other. We don't enter into communion with God. And the second thing is, while we tend to isolate ourselves, we, that kind of negative attitude causes people to segregate from us. How many of you want to hang around somebody who has nothing good to say about anything? Are those your best friends? They talk about how, I mean, how long would you hang around someone who talked about how much you need to, you're heavy, you're overweight, you got a bad attitude, you know, you need to get your hair cut, gosh, you smell bad. How many are going to hang around him for very, them for very long? I don't even give it to your brother or sister or, or whatever. You're not going to, you're just going to avoid it. And those kinds of negative things are what's going to happen is they cause isolation individually in our own spirit and it causes separation from others, which is something we all desire. And what we need to do is to cast down every evil imagination. Now in context, in, he, in first, second, first Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, that's why I can't get it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, what happens is he's talking about the people of Athens who had a God for everything and thought process for everything. They were intellectual, they were this, they were that, they could reason away anything. And what he was saying in, in, in regards to that is get rid of all those thoughts that come against the knowledge of Christ. We need to understand who Christ is. We need to know what he is and who he is. And in understanding that, when those wrong thoughts come in, we can cast them down. If we don't know, then we cannot ever. Now, one of the things that I would say happens when we begin this process is we become happier. And I'm going to tell you what's one of the cries of the world. I want to be happy or I want peace. That's it. I want to be happy. You want to be happy, begin to put on the mind of Christ. You will be happy. And I want you to know something else. It will give you a more accurate view of the world. My older brothers refer to me as I wear rose-colored glasses when it comes to my father. My father, I don't wear rose-colored glasses. He was abusive. He... Didn't like what I was doing in the backyard, so he pulled out a gun and took a shot at me. He beat me with a baseball bat because the bed broke. And I don't mean a wood bat, it was, it was a, a hard whiffle bat, but let me tell you, it still hurt. Okay? He was a harsh disciplinarian. But I look back at all those things, I remember the good things he did, and I also say to my brothers and everybody, he did what he did because he thought that's what you do to help somebody. He, he, I didn't have a father who maliciously got drunk and burned cigarettes out of my arm. That's just cruel. But he was a harsh disciplinarian. He was abusive by today's standards. So I look back and in my arm, the first thing I say is my father loved me, even though he never said it. I know he loved me. His actions spoke louder than words. And he really cared for my best. He wasn't good at it. He thought he could beat it out of me. He thought he could beat it out of my brother. He thought that strong discipline and a strong right hand would correct those things. He, he spoke to me in anger. He disciplined me in anger. But his motive was to make me a better person, and I could see that. Those aren't rose-colored glasses. There was nothing pleasant, and there was, it's not that I don't recognize what happened. I choose to look at the positive. Now, I didn't ever beat my kids for that reason. They got spankings every once in a while. Once in a blue moon, one of them will actually get a slap in the face once. And she actually said I deserved it, so. Not Ashley. <laughs> no, it wasn't Ashley. I don't want to mention names. Well, you said mine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and what happens is those things never come to pass for whatever reason. But what you need to understand is if you change the way you think. And now I will tell you, my younger brother who didn't think that way has struggled with his whole life. Two of my older brothers died young because they struggled with discipline and who he was. And it caused them a wrong mindset, a wrong thing. One brother, I mean, two of my older brothers died and they were in their 60s and early, late, late 50s. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, just abusive 
abuse to their body, abusive relationship. My younger brother is still alive, but he's had three heart attacks and he's younger than I am. Because whatever he did, he allowed those things, instead of looking and changing the way he thinks, which he knows better, and he did come to church for a while, he understands the truth, but he never let it change who he was. He still held on to that anger, he still hung on to the bitterness, the resentment, and all those things, and what they did was create in him a significant amount of pain all the time, so that he's always looking for a painkiller. Now, does that mean... I'm unrealistic? Does that mean I have rose-colored glasses on? Absolutely not. It means I've chosen to find the positive, to look for the good, and I've chosen, of course, the path of forgiveness, the path of grace, simply because that's what I want from God. And I'm much healthier. My younger brother looks, oh, I want to know, who's in the room? How much older did he look? A couple of 20, 30 years? 15 years. Huh? <laughs> At least 15 to 20 years older than me. Um, because he's allowed those things to just destroy him. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. But every time, every time, an evil imagination. Now, when I use the word evil imagination, how many of you know what that means? What's an evil imagination? How would you define it? Who wants to try? Come on, it's gotta get very sold out here. I'll call on somebody, Nathan. <laughs> What's an evil imagination? I thought someone would come to your rescue. Uh, <laughs> evil imagination is any thought that is contrary to the word of God. That's it. Any thought that says don't love, don't forgive, don't be gracious, don't be merciful, don't be, don't be uh, assert, don't, don't, don't give them the time of day. Any single thought that rises itself a, above the word of God. Be angry. Now, when I talk about anger, I'm not talking about righteous anger. The scripture says you can be angry and sin not. But lots of times we're angry and we sin a lot. We wish somebody dead. That's a sin. We... Hope that a lack of a term, karma gets them. And you know I don't believe in karma. But what goes around comes around. Well, there is a scriptural truth to that. You reap what you sow, right? My girls were younger. I'll never forget this. One of them hit, kicked her sister, and that's the, and I caught her. And uh, I said, you know better than that. You can do unto others as you would have others do unto you. You know better than that. And she says. Well, she kicked me first, so I figured she wanted me to kick her. <laughs> I said, no, you can't change scripture like that. You've got to, and, but that's what we do with our minds. We allow evil imaginations to come in, and we justify what those evil imaginations are. And I want you to understand something. They destroy us. Scripture says, if a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We use the word heart, but that word in the Hebrew can be translated mind, soul, emotions. He's saying what you think about is going to dictate who you are. So what we need to focus on is God's word and God's way. And how do you do that? Now, I brought this too far, and I shared this in the beginning of the year, that one of the things God spoke to me was that I was living a hurried life. Which what Bill showed is I thought about everything all the time. Given any situation, I thought about every scenario that could happen. I rehearsed things in my mind that never, ever occurred. And when someone said to me, that's awful. It must be terrible to be you. And I go, no, no, I love it. I'm always prepared. Well, I was reading a book, and God said, can you ever be in the moment? And I got so convicted. Because I would be, I remember, I, I talked to, I, Bill was sitting here, and I said, you know, I would talk to people, and I would look right through them. I was doing my very best to give them all the attention I possibly could. But my mind was what I'm going to do as soon as I'm done being nice to him. And God said, that's not okay. But I could justify it. And it said, but it's not okay. I needed to learn what it was to trust God for all that stuff that's going on and live in the moment. Now, I'm still working on it, but it's way better than it used to be. Driving on the road, I would look at every scenario. 
I would watch all the cars. I would watch everybody break. I would, and, and Pastor Gail drives me to go to work because she gets car sick if anybody else drives. So I'm watching all this stuff and she's, I don't see any of that stuff and nothing ever happens to me. And I'm like, I can't change that. Because I see the guy cutting off, watch this guy going to cut you off, this one's going to do this, that's going to happen, watch that, you know, I just see, I see it all, and I'm because I'm trying my very best to be prepared, and it's okay to be prepared, but I, God spoke to me that it was an evil imagination. I wanted so much to be prepared, as much as I said I trust God, I was trusting in my preparation. Now, God says, be prepared. He said, no man builds a house, doesn't count the cost. He says, be prepared. But there's a balance. And I was way, way over here trying to prepare for everything. So if I had to give you advice, the first thing I would say, be mindful of what you think about. Be mindful of what you think about. Now, I'm going to give you the negative side. If you're thinking about revenge, if you're thinking about getting even, if you're thinking about uh, selfish thoughts, then that's really obvious to that you need not to think about those things. Those are evil imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of Christ. But what if it's a neutral thing like trying to be prepared? When does that become a problem? When it is more important than maybe there's people around you, or more important, than God himself. And I'm not saying don't be prepared. I'm not saying don't do any of those things. I'm saying God must be first. The moment a thought, a thought process, or anything of that exalts itself either to the level of Christ or above Christ, it is now an evil imagination because nothing is his equal and absolutely nothing is his superior. So we don't think about things. We cast those evil imaginations down. It's easy for me to say, lay aside every sin. Because most of us know what sins we have. And I get angry once in a while. I do this. I think bad thoughts. You know, I, I, I smoke the occasional cigarette. I do this, I do that. I, whatever you think is a sin, you know what it is. I don't need to tell you. So you lay, cast down every, lay down every sin. But the evil imagination, I'm going to tell you something. Listen very carefully. No one, as a pastor, no one wants to hear me say what I'm about to say. I don't care about your sin. If you cast down the evil imaginations, the sins will disappear. You don't need me to tell you what your sins are. You, you don't need me to tell you what you're doing wrong. You don't need to tell me what your bad attitudes are. You don't need my help. The Holy Spirit will do that for you. But if you learn to cast down every evil imagination, I guarantee you those sins will not pop up. Because you're changing the way you think. You're getting tuned into the presence of the Holy Spirit. So you need to be mindful of what you're thinking about. The first thing, now Paul says it this way, Philippians 4, 8. Now I bet every, well there's only two of them, but every girl who was ever in missionettes or whatever we call them can quote this verse. Everybody in my house I'm sure can quote this verse. Because what it does, it gives us, it, it causes us to see things through the lens of the Holy Spirit, which is what we need to do next. To see things through the lens of the Holy Spirit. What that verse simply says is, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are right, whatever, whatever is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, if it is praiseworthy, think on such things. So now, all of a sudden, we're putting before us this lens in which we view everything. Gee, was that, was that, what we just said, praiseworthy? Was it loving? Was it gracious? Was it worthy of God? Oh my God. I know. But once you put those lenses on and you allow the Holy Spirit to filter what you're thinking, what you're saying, what you're doing, it will change who you are. If you change your mind, you will change your life. And if you change your life, you'll change your destiny. 
Ooh. Uh oh. It's that important. It's that important. We all remember the story of the little train, right? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I know you can through Jesus Christ. And when it comes to your mind, I'm going to say something that might sound a little weird, but I'm going to uh, to understand this. With the exception of what we can learn from it, the past is usually an evil imagination. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're looking to the past, and I, I, I have to tell you, while I have things in my own life that I can look at and say they were horrible, um, and I can look at the past, being taken advantage of, my father being abusive, lied about, uh, I, the list goes on. We all have them. If I stay there, my present will be terrible and I won't have a future. I'm going to tell you. Are you ready? I'm going to ask somebody to do something. If somebody in the room can do it, stand up. I'd like you, everybody to look left. Everybody look right. Now look left and right at the same time. <laughs> Come on, can you do it? None of us can. And why would I say that? Because you can't look where you've been and see where you're going. It cannot happen. When we are busy looking back, you will never live in the present and you will not have a future. Or the you'll, you'll have a future if you live. You understand the point. But I guarantee you, your future will not be nothing more than a repeat of your past. Because that's where your focus is. That's where your mind is. So we need to look forward. Romans Ephesians chapter 4, 23 says, be made new, I love this, be made new in the attitude of your mind. Change the way you think, and you'll change your destiny. You'll change who you are. Paul said, be transformed. How many of that word transform is, it's the word we get um, for metamorphosis. So we all know what that is, right? A little tadpole turns into a frog. So what he's saying is, if you renew your mind, change the way you think. Cast out every evil imagination. Lay aside every weight and every sin. Change your mind. You can be a completely different person. A new creature. Uh oh In Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. I am new. I am a butterfly. I was going to say frog, but who wants to be a frog? <laughs> I'm no longer a crawling little, creepy little caterpillar. I'm a beautiful butterfly. Because a metamorphosis has taken place. I have been transformed by the renewing of my mind. I am laying aside every sin. I am casting down every evil imagination. I am taking off every weight that would hinder me in my relationship with God. Why? Because I want the presence of God to be active in my life here and now. I am not satisfied with the sweet, no, wait a minute. Great by and by. Help me with that hymn, somebody. What? The sweet by and by. Now that's great. If that's all you want, praise the Lord, you can have it. I don't want just that. I don't want to live through life struggling with my past. I don't want to live through life struggling in my present. I don't want to have no future just looking for the day when I die and get to be with Jesus. Praise the Lord. I want to be with Jesus today and have a life that's abundant life. Not just living, abundant life. Zoe, every area of my life is blessed because I know the Lord and I'm walking in His righteousness. I'm being sanctified daily in His presence. That's what I want. How about you? I want to have love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance. I want to be happy. I want to be prospered in the natural as I'm prospered in my spirit. Hallelujah. How about you? How that happens 
is to cast down every lamentation, to lay aside every sin, to take off every weight, and move forward in Christ Jesus. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't exactly know what you want to do, but I will tell you this. If you begin this process today, tomorrow will be better. And it will get progressively better every day that follows. Can you come up? I'm going to try to give three quick points. That's past the gale, that's ready for the song. So if you're paying attention, you gotta look, listen real carefully. Romans says, I mean the Hebrews tells us, lay aside every cast, lay aside every sin and, and cast down every weight. Cast off every weight and lay aside every sin that so easily besets us. So first off, you ready? Very simply. I'm only gonna give you a sentence. I don't want to delve into it. I want you, let's go with one. As everybody can, can follow me here, let's go with one. How many have at least one sin in your life? Okay. How many have one that is on the top of the list that you're saying, God wants me to get rid of today? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. No one's going to ask you what it is. You ready? I'm going to give you simple advice. Take a real look at what that is, what, how it's weighing you down, and decide to do something about it. A good, let me give you a good example. I, I don't believe that I was lazy and selfish, but I was. So how did I do something about it? I started serving and doing for others no matter what, so that it would change who I am. Do something about it. If, if, you want, if you feel that smoking cigarettes, and I'm not picking on, it's between you and God if it's a sin. Everybody heard that, right? But if that's something you want to give up, then I'm going to tell you something. There are two ways to do it. Throw them away if you believe God will give you the strength, but stop buying them. God will give you the strength. Or at least take steps towards doing it. If you smoke 20 cigarettes a day, smoke 18 a week, a day. Smoke 18 a day. Do that for a week. Then do 16. Then do 14. When you get down to one, if you and God don't have enough strength to get rid of one a day, there's a problem there, I'm sorry to tell you. But take steps for doing it. And I want to tell you something else, you ready? My daughter has this, one of her favorite quotes, where'd she go? Fail. Try. No. Fail. Fail again. Try, never fail, no matter. Fail, fail again, fail better. Just keep doing it. If you fail, get up and do it. God says, a righteous man will I pick up seven times the number of completeness and fullness. It simply means if you fall down and you keep trying, God will pick you up, put you back on the path, keep going. But I fell again, pick you up, keep going. No matter how many times you fail, get up and try again. I guarantee you, you will have victory. And the last one I want to mention is something that we don't like to do, but every successful program to overcome stuff has it in it. And that's create yourself some accountability. And there's a lot of men here today, so I'm going to tell you, men don't like to do this. Because when we create ourselves some level of accountability, we think that it makes us vulnerable and weak. It goes back to our most basis instinct to be strong and protect ourselves from other men. That's why this, I mean, the last funniest thing in the world. Do you know that's why the handshake was developed, right? So they would grab somebody's right hand and shake out any weapon. And they didn't go like we do. Oh, good to see you, brother. It was, get here. <laughs> they wanted to shake any weapon you had in your sleeve out. <laughs> they wanted to get rid of everything you had. What we need, and the reason we need accountability is because you need to stand. How many of you have ever heard of AA? We all heard of AA, right? You know the first thing they give you in AA? A sponsor. Somebody that you can say with, I'm having a hard time today. I'm struggling. I blew it today. What do I do? Well, you blew it today? Good. Well, tomorrow is a new day. You stop now, and tomorrow we start day one. Today, I'm a day sober. We move forward. In anything that you do, they want accountability. 
the biggest AA, the biggest program in the world, the first thing they'll say, the most successful program out there is, I need a higher power, I need to be accountable for something above myself. If you want success, make yourself accountable. And not because you're going to have someone uh, is going to weed you out, but simply because of 95% of all growth in our spirit or in our emotion happens within the confines of an intimate relationship, a close friend or a brother. Cast down every evil imagination. Lay aside every weight and every sin. Walk in the fullness of Christ. Amen. Let's all stand this morning as we pray. And we'll close with a song. I'm going to pray. And then we'll sing a song, but we are dismissed. Lord, I ask right now that your Holy Spirit filter every word that I said. Lord, that every word came as an unction of the Holy Spirit to speak directly to the heart. Lord, I, I come against any mindset, any spirit of, of anger and, and resentment. Who is he to tell me? Lord, I cast it out right now in the name of Jesus. But Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit speak to every life and every heart this morning. I ask that your Holy Spirit renew every mind this morning. That we transform, that we have metamorphosis in every mind this morning. That we might know what it is, what an evil imagination is, and how to cast it down. That we might change our minds from the negative to the positive in Christ Jesus. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit let this word go deep in every heart. Teach us, Lord, what are the weights that hinder us on the race that you set before us. Reveal to us the sins that might beset us and tumble us or entangle us. Show us, Lord, the evil imaginations that we think of, the evil imaginations that come from the worldview that we live in, the evil imaginations that come from our schools, from our government, from our jobs. Teach us, Lord, what they are and allow us to cast them down and exalt the name of Jesus. Your will, your way, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. Allow us, Lord, to walk in the fullness and the understanding of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.